Don redirecting to Facebook Live page. I believe we're live. Great. Um, let's see what, yep, yeah, that looks like we're live. And uh, let's go to the Zoom here, good. So, hey everybody, um, this is Dr. Brad Goodman. This is Doc Talk Live, and I have with me Dr. Paul Kim of California Orthopedics and Spine. Uh, Dr. Kim is a foot and ankle specialist uh, in California. Welcome, Dr. Kim. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dr. Goodman. Really good to be here. Um, when uh, when we set this up, um, uh, and we are going to talk about minimally invasive uh, bunion surgery. Um, that's the that's the topic, right? Correct. But but was it yesterday or the day before Tiger Woods was involved in a in a motor vehicle accident and, and I think had some major trauma to his leg. Um, I don't really watch the news all that much, but I, if you could uh, maybe fill us in a little bit, since that may be a bit up your alley uh, with uh, some, some, uh, some thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So from what I've gathered from the news media is he sustained a open fracture, a uh, compound fracture of his tibia, as well as some fractures within his foot. Um, he did undergo surgery where they placed a tibial rod for his tibial fracture, and they put some pins and screw for his foot, but I don't know the exact pathology or the nature of the fracture pattern. Uh, one of the things I have concerned about his pathology and injury is that it is a high energy mechanism injury, which in itself is gonna cause a lot of soft tissue injury. And so not only does the bone have to heal, but the soft tissue also has to heal. Very commonly, when we place the tibial nail rod into the fracture site, you typically either have to go through the patellar tendon or next to the patellar tendon. So a lot of these patients, once their bone heals, they have a lot of knee pain. So given, you know, Tiger Woods is a golfer, he depends on that knee rotation. My concern is, is his knee going to ever be able to rehabilitate to his pre-injury level and able to uh, compete at a high end level? I don't know. So that would be a question I have. So you're more worried about the knee than the ankle? Um, I just don't know what kind of ankle injury he had. They, they basically just released that they had some pins and screws placed, but that's as far as I know. I know that he did have open fractures, both in his ankle and his proximal tibia, from what I've Ooh. read. Uh, but exact, that's exactly, uh, that's as much as I know. And I think especially within the acute period, um, if you compare his fracture pattern, I, I ha my question would be, is it a fracture that, you know, uh, that athlete Alex Smith had not too long ago, maybe about a year or two ago? And so with those injuries, not only do you have to worry about infection, but you also have to worry about uh, compartment syndrome, which I do think that Alex Smith did have. Um. How long do you think it will take for him to heal, um, to, to, to fully recover from that type of injury? Well, typically bone heals on average between six to 10 weeks. However, what you have to also account for is the mechanism of injury, which in this case was a high energy mechanism of injury. So you have to also account for the soft tissue pathology. So realistically, it's probably he's gonna start walking around six to eight weeks and you're looking at another six to eight weeks of very intensive rehab. I think maybe if he were to tr get back onto the course and try to hit a ball, I would probably say the earliest would be at three months. Um, I can't imagine anything sooner than that. Wow, wow. All right, well, let's talk about Bunyan. Um, is, uh, you have a minimally invasive technique to treat Bunyan, and, and tell us a little bit about what, what Bunyan is. Um, if you have images, that would be great. And tell us about what you're doing to uh, work on that. Oh, yeah, sure. Would it be okay if I shared my screen? Please. Okay. Oh, I think it said it's disabled uh, screen sharing. All right, let me take a look here. Oh. Share. So you can't share? Uh, when I click share, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Hmm. I'm going to hit share here and see what that does. Tell me if it does that. Oh, I'm, I'm seeing your screen. I see. So I'm going to stop share. Um, participants. No, I don't want to invite you more. How about more? 
no, that's not it. Reactions record. So, so for some reason, I can't let you share. I don't know why that is. Um, mm -hmm. Share screen. Let's try this one. One participant. Mul I'll hit multiple participants can share. Now, now, does that work for you? Oh yeah, no, that works now. Perfect. Perfect. So I did create a little uh, presentation just talking about. Oh good, look at that. Bunion. So let me go ahead and uh, play this for you. All right. So yeah, so I wanted to say thank you for inviting me to this show. We're really excited about talking about this because I do think it is a game changer in a sense. Awesome. So before I start, I just wanted to kind of share my background. So I do have 14 years of postgraduate training and that's because I actually have a podiatry degree. I did go through four years of med school after that at Wayne State. I had my orthopedic residency at University of Washington and foot and ankle fellowship at hospital for special surgery. And right wow. now I practice at California Orthopedic Spine. Yeah, exactly. So I'm interested <laughs> in your pathway. So I'm from Detroit originally. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, but look at you. You 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 started out in Irvine. Where is Samuel Merritt College? That's in Oakland, California. So East Bay. All right. So California, California, Michigan, then all the way back out to Washington, then all the way back to New York. And Correct, now yeah. back to uh, San Francisco. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. And the reason I wanted to in include this slide is because even though minimally invasive bunion is a newer technique, um, I come through the old school training where tried and true works. But also this has taught me that sometimes innovation, if it's a game changer, we need to adapt and apply it and use it for the better of our patients. So I think when people think of bunion surgery, there's two things that come to mind a very long recovery, and more than anything, it's a very painful surgery if you're ever gonna have bunion surgery. And if you look at the literature, there's over a hundred bunion procedure types listed, which is crazy. So as a patient, how do you even choose the right procedure? You know, you can go to different surgeons, everyone has their varying opinions. So how do you choose? Well, this is a typical bunion surgery that are usually open procedures. One, you were kept non-weight bearing for six weeks or more. Usually recovery time is six to 12 months. That's a very large time commitment for individuals. A very common thing you can get after bunion surgery is called arthrofibrosis, which is stiffness of the toe joint. Also with these open procedures, you have higher complication rates. Recurrence in open bunion surgeries, even literature states up to 20%. That's a very high recurrence rate. And of course, these large surgical scars. This is actually statements that I used to get from my patients. They said that even after my bunion surgery, they were like, this is the most pain I've ever experienced in my life. And then family and friends who've had bunion surgery obviously would say, never get it done. Why do we get bunions? Is it genetic? Is it hereditary? Do you think it's from our shoes? Why do we you know, get it? It's actually multifactorial. So it's both genetic, hereditary. There are external influences. So there was actually a study back in 19, I think 50, talking about shotted and unshotted individuals, meaning that if people never wear shoes, do they get bunions? And the answer is yes, they do get bunions. So there is a hereditary genetic component to it, but there's a direct influence from the type of shoe wear and activity wear. So there's, it's a multifactorial ideology. And, and people say, well, yeah. Included in bunion, do you include hallux rigidus? Uh, no, hallux rigidus has a little bit different pathology. And I'll show you one of my patient uh, slides, why bunion surgery can actually in a, in a way, indirectly help hallux rigidus. Because hallux rigidus is either caused by bone spurs, it's either caused by metatarsis primus elevatus, it's either caused by it, it, like inflammatory conditions. So it's not just one etiology that causes hallux rigidus. Okay, I have hallux rigidus. That's why oh, I, have, okay. I have an incredibly large um, metatarsal phalangeal joint, that mm. great toe joint. It's just yep. ginormous. Yeah. And it's hard to fit in shoes. Yeah, um, yeah. The last six months or so, it hasn't really hurt me nearly as much as it usually does. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't affect my function. And I'm very, very afraid of pursuing surgery. No, I, I, that's the same thing even with bunion pathology. I tell people, look, this is not for aesthetics. This is for function and for pain. So if it's limiting your function and if it's causing pain, then I think it is time that you should investigate a possible bunion surgery. All right, let me let you keep going. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no, absolutely. So this is our, you know, typical open bunion surgery. 
you know, for me, my tried and true, it's a lapidus bunionectomy. This is how I was trained. These are, this is the bunion surgery that I would have performed about three years ago, because I've been doing the MIS surgery for about three years. So as you can see, the there's a bunion without surgery and screws, and there's a bunion post-surgery and screws and a staple. Now those red lines indicate the actual surgical incision. So they're pretty large incisions. And you gotta know that when we make these incisions, we're also dissecting down to the bone. So it's a very large operative field, a lot of dissection, a lot of pain. Mm. This surgery works well. However, this is by far one of the most painful surgeries I used to perform. And my patients would always tell me that. But in the end, it does take about six to 12 months to recover. In the end, are they happy? Yeah. But it was six to 12 months of pretty hard, intensive rehab. All right, so the before is on the right. Is that correct? Yes, correct. So, so what, what actually have you done here? Have you lengthened the, what, what, what are these screws doing down here? What is yeah, this? So we, that is actually fusing the joint. It's fusing the first tarsal metatarsal joint. And the way we fuse that is we actually take a triangular wedge out of the base of either the metatarsal or the cuneiform. We bring those edges together and then we use crossing and screws to fuse that joint. On the big toe, we take another small wedge of bone and we close it. It's a closing wedge osteotomy. It's called an Aiken osteotomy to realign the foot. That incision, that red line between the first and second toe, that's what we call a lateral capsular release. Gotcha. So if you look at it, see the two little dots underneath the metatarsal head? Those are your sesamoids. So you do want to bring those sesamoids underneath the metatarsal head. And if I had to critique this x-ray, I would say, you don't, I didn't really do a perfect job of reducing my sesamoids. Can you put your pointer two. on the sesamoids for our viewers? Your, your cursor, uh, maybe they would see my it. Better. Cursor I have my cursor is not working right now. All right, that's uh, fine. Okay. Yeah. But it's those two little circular dots. I see it, I see yeah. it. I just want to make sure my, my, my audience can see it. All right, let's continue, great. Yeah. Okay. And then, so the question is then, why did I choose to transition my bunion surgery to the minimally invasive bunion surgery? Well, there's a few things. Well, it's a faster recovery. My patients after this minimally invasive bunion surgery start to walk between two to four weeks. Usually a lot of them are back to activities about six to eight weeks. There's minimal surgical scar, which equates to minimal surgical dissection. So we're talking about four incisions that are about two millimeters in length. You get optimal results. Why? Because it's a triplane correctional deformity. So I like to explain that when you think about triplane, it's like geometry, X, Y, and Z. We're correcting in all three planes. And there's actually less complications. I've done over a hundred of these and I've had zero non-unions. I mean, sometimes the hard work can become symptomatic. Sometimes you can get a little paresthesias. Yeah, sometimes you get wound problems, but nothing catastrophic. It's very minimal complications. So how do you do it? Show us how you do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so the surgery is quick. It's about 30 to 45 minutes. And all in all, it's a very high satisfaction rate. So let's just start cases. So here's a case. Uh, this is a patient with a pre-bunion on the right, and then you see post-bunion on the left. Those little red lines are the incisions that I made on their foot. Now, if you come from the top to the bottom, you can see the third line from the top. Yeah. That's where you actually break the bone with a burr. That's how the minimally invasive surgery is performed. It's actually with a, a high torque, low speed burr. Also, that second line from the top uh, that's where we also take that ache and osteotomy. So again, this is using a very similar methodologies that we use for open procedures, but we're just doing it at minimally invasive, basically operating underneath the skin. Once we have the bone cut, we translate it and we put the screws across to stabilize it. And so this is a patient of mine. She's a year out, all of her bone is remodeled. And this is her foot at one year from surgery. As you can see, the scar is very hard to decipher. I mean. The scars have matured, her foot looks normal, very happy and pleased with the cosmetic, as well as the functional results. Why, why have you only been doing this for three years? How come, how come this hasn't been, been done for the last 20 years? I assume- The technology is new. What it, what's new about the technology? You've had a burr forever. You've had an x-ray forever. Yeah. What, what is new about the technology? 
it's actually it's it's there's a few components to it. So people have tried this in the past with just a burr. Like you said, a burr is a burr. What's the big difference? Well, the burr for this instance is a high torque, low speed. That's the key. Because if you have a high speed, high torque burr, it'll just wrap up every single thing it touches. Two, okay. the screws that we're using these days are called variable pitch. So if I go back here, if you really look at these screws, the little thread distances, there's a variable pitch to them. So as you're advancing the screws, you're actually compressing. So this isn't just a average screw. This is what we call a headless compression screw. So and, it's the technique, it's the burr, it's also the hardware that we're using. And, and, and you know, like if you think about taking somebody's gallbladder out, okay? When I trained, they didn't do it laparoscopically. They did an open procedure, okay? Mm -hmm. Now it's all done laparoscopically. Um, is this now the standard of care or is it going to be the standard of care? Where are we in that spectrum, in that crossover? I think we're in the very early stages of it because it's not widely adopted. Because if you look at training of residents, um, I mean, in residency, I was never taught this. This is something I learned in practice. Two, to do this, it does take uh, a lot of spatial awareness and it's actually not easy to do. So, you know, I try, I, I have held the workshops where I try to teach this to other surgeons but I've realized that this is actually not as simple as you would think. Um, I mean, for me, it, it was pretty easy to pick up. And the way I learned is by applying the minimally invasive technique, but in an open procedure setting. So as I got more comfortable, my incisions became smaller and then that's how it progressed. Okay. So it was over a process. All right, I'm, I'm very curious. Okay, is there another case or? Yeah, no, I have a few cases. So. Okay. That's her at one year. Then, you know, a case two, uh, this is again, a very young patient of mine. Um, she had a bunch, she actually saw different opinions. She saw, I think three other providers and was told all these different varying opinions. And I told, well, you are a good candidate for a minimally invasive. Now she's still a little bit in the acute rehab cause she's only four weeks out from surgery. So that's why the bone doesn't look completely healed. But the reason I wanted to include this because I wanted to show you proof that at four weeks that she is walking. So this is her foot before and after surgery. Mm -hmm. And this is her at four weeks of surgery. And so her foot is broken, but it's stabilized by those screws. Her bump and bunion pain is gone and she's pretty ecstatic and pretty happy. So, you know, I don't know what people are gonna see this, where they're gonna see this, but, but they're gonna wonder how they, if they have this problem, how they find somebody who would offer this in a minimally invasive fashion. What would, yeah, that's, what would uh, you, what would you Google search to, to sort of, you know, find a provider that would offer this type of treatment? There is a, so there's one company that I use, it's called Wright Medical and it's called ProStep. ProStep, very good. Correct. And they do have a list of their approved providers that they have undergone their training. Uh, gotcha. The caveat to that though is, you know, I don't know how many numbers they require for them to actually perform to be on that website. Um, I mean, even in the area I am in, um, it's not very widely adopted. I think for me personally, that I'm the only surgeon that I know of that really does it in the entire Bay Area. But as wind catches on, I think that this will start increasing in terms of the providers uh, providing it. It's, uh, I mean, it's just, it's a game changer, like you said, that's why. Oh, that's uh, exactly, that's I, I mean, you took my, you took my last slide away. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see it. So I have uh, just a few more cases I just wanted to go through real quick. So this is another patient of mine. She had, again, was told by another surgeon, hey, you're gonna have an open procedure. You're looking at a good six to eight month recovery. And she was like, this doesn't sound great at all. So she actually sought me through some friends and we proceeded with the minimally invasive bunion. These are her surgeries before and after x-rays. But more so, it's just a clinical picture. Like this is her walking on the left at two weeks. Now you can see she's walking with some antalgia. She has some pain. She's walking very slowly. And she's like, yeah, that foot hurts, but look, Two weeks later, walking in shoes. This is her just at four weeks after bunion surgery. Incredible. 
Any particular shoes you recommend, by the way? Um, you know, I like, so I like athletic shoes. Um, me personally, I'm a New Balance Saucony type of guy. Um, a lot of my patients in the area like the brand Hoka, but I think any good athletic shoes that have good midfoot support. So the way, if you take a, a foot model and if you were to bend it in half, it doesn't, it's the foot shouldn't bend in the middle aside from where the big toe and the lesser toe joints are. So if a shoe bends in the middle where you don't really have those essential joints, that's not a good shoe. Two, I take a shoe and I torque it. So if you can completely torque it, that's probably not ideal. That's that good. Okay? That's good. Now, can you bend it in the middle where the Adidas stripes are? See, not ideal. Okay, good to know. So also try to torque it like this. See how easily it torques? Mm -hmm. Not ideal. So you want a shoe that has good torque control in the midfoot, that doesn't bend in the midfoot and also has a good solid rigid heel cup that supports your heel as you impact and lift off. So what tennis shoe, because this is a tennis shoe, what tennis shoe do you recommend? Uh, again, it, it, even the good brands sometimes have bad shoes. Uh, I personally feel that if you put a good supportive orthotic, you can almost make any bad shoe into a good shoe. Gotcha. Okay. I digress. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah. So I just have uh, two more cases left. Now, this is an interesting case. So I think x-rays always don't correlate to what the foot looks like. So on the right, this patient of mine had surgery by another provider. She went in with a little bit of forefoot pain, came out with pain so immense that she cannot walk. Her foot looks deformed. It doesn't look like on this x-ray, but I will show you next what her foot used to look like. We decided to perform a minimally invasive revision bunion surgery, as well as what we call distal metatarsal osteotomy, where basically just cut the metatarsal heads and let them sit where they want to sit without any hardware. It sounds very crazy, but it works. Wow. And you've cut them all too. We cut them all. So as you can see, her foot on the left is what she started with. The x-ray, if you looked at the x-ray and you look at her foot, they look completely different. This foot looks deformed. This is her just two weeks after surgery. So you can see all the little poke holes where we did our minimally invasive surgery, osteotomies and bunion correction. And this is her walking at two months. Now she's walking slow. I wanted to include it. She's walking slow because her foot was so messed up it messed up her back. So she's like, look, my foot feels great, but my back is in so much pain right now because of that bad foot that I've been walking around for over a year. All right, so I have one final uh, case I wanted to talk about. Now, oh, sorry, I actually have two more cases. So this is a, I wanted to include this because the minimally invasive bunion surgery is so well tolerated. It's probably one of the only surgeries I perform bilaterally. So this is a patient of mine who had bilateral bunion surgery. At now, the same time, I, I see At the same said. time. Yes. And Dr. Goodman, you remember you asked about uh, hallux rigidus. Now, just look at her pre-operative x-rays and look at her post-operative x-rays. What I want you to focus on is the big toe joint. Look how much more congruous it looks now after surgery. Oh, yeah. That's because we actually, remember I said it's a triplane deformity correction, X, Y, Z. We rotate it, we translate, we angulate it. So even for hallux rigidus people, this can benefit if you do have a hallux valgus deformity. And so that's what I was telling you. Sometimes it can be used to address hallux rigidus as well. Because I've done this where we don't even translate. We just even rotate it. And that, that's all you need. And so this is her before. This is her at six weeks. And this is her walking pain-free at six weeks after bilateral bunion surgery. Um, there are some questions that I'm now seeing. Um, um, what is the biggest factor you believe? I, so um, Jerome Fryer wants to know what is the biggest factor in terms of um, causing a bunion deformity? Um, you know, there, there's not just one. It's a, it's a multifactorial process. There's a hereditary component to it. Sometimes there's a collagen deformity component to it. There's shoe wear components to it. There's activity level component to it. You can actually get uh, bunion from post-trauma. 
surprisingly. And I've seen that happen. So it's not just one factor. Like you can't say, oh, everyone that wears high heels is going to get a bunion, which isn't true. So okay. it's multifactorial. All right. All right. Case six. Yeah, this is the, now this is the last case. I wanted to include this because like I said, bunion surgery that I do is not for aesthetics. Now, in the end, you do get an aesthetic result, but it's not always about aesthetics. As you can see in this x-ray, she had bilateral bunion surgery, as well as what we call distal metatarsal osteotomy. Her foot, as you can see on the right, that's before and after surgery. You're like, well, that doesn't really look that different. Her foot still looks like it has a bunion. It's a little deformed. What it matters is function. This person could barely walk. She had gone to a lot of other providers, was given very opinions. I mean, she could not walk. She walks with, she used to walk with a cage. She almost walked like she was like 30 years her age. And so we did this surgery and this is her walking at three months. She's playing tennis. She's hiking. She's going on Hawaii trips. I mean, she's enjoying life. So can it's, you, it's can a life changer. You, can you go back to that slide, the last slide? So you broke again the second and third metatarsals? Correct. And they just... That, that's fine. It doesn't cause problems. <laughs> they, they heal. But then the way you cut it, you do have to cut it at an angle. So it's not just cutting it transverse across. So what you do is you cut it at an angle and this metatarsal head settles into a right position. And given that you're not really disrupting tissue, it's just a small poke hole, the hematoma starts to calcify and you get a bone callus formation. It just heals. So the healed image is where? So on the left, you're still healing when the right is more. So even though she had bilateral, we did space her specifically three months apart. Gotcha. So you see more of a healed situation, the third <laughs> image uh, from Correct. the left. Yes. Got it. Got it. But regardless, this is her walking at three months after, or after both surgeries. Excellent. And so finally, I want to just say in conclusion, you know, MIB, minimally invasive bunion, less invasive, faster recovery. It, you can actually do as a bilateral procedure because a lot of people have bilateral bunions. Lower complication rate, very, very high patient satisfaction rate. And overall, as Dr. Goodman said, this is a game changer. It's a, it's a game changing treatment for bunions. So I'm just gonna encourage people to share this with folks that you know have foot problems. Paul, I want to thank you for your time and taking taking time out of your busy practice to show us this stuff. Um, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Goodman. It was a pleasure being on. Uh, and then if you have a, you know, if something comes up down the road that uh, you want to share with us, let us know. You're welcome back anytime. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, we also try to do Doc Talk takeovers where if you could take us into the OR. I don't know if you can do that if you if you have control over your ambulatory surgery settings, but if you could uh, take over and if you get on my site, you'll see that we've done uh, a lot of or live orthopedic surgery, like knee replacement, uh, various things. So- uh, Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. definitely look into that. That'd be awesome, Paul. Have a great afternoon. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.